All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Clark. And I'm Cole Carton. And for our senior capstone, we conducted a risk model assessment for encryption in critical infrastructure facilities. Just to give you guys a brief overview of what we're going to be going over, uh, we're going to start with an introduction, then move on to our problem statement, uh, then the project goal, impact of industrial cyber attacks, methodology, results, conclusions, and finish it out with acknowledgments and questions and comments. To give a brief introduction of our project, uh, critical infrastructure facilities are currently entering the fourth industrial revolution. It's coined as the term Industry 4.0. Uh, Industry 4.0 brings connectivity, intelligence, and automation, as well as cyber physical systems to these critical infrastructure facilities. Uh, the increased cyber physical systems within these facilities generates a greater risk of cyber attacks. In order to help prevent these attacks, these critical infrastructure facilities are debating whether they or not they should encrypt their data from the process level all the way to the enterprise level. So to state the official problem statement of our project, as cyber attacks continue to rise in frequency, critical infrastructure facilities are determining whether or not to encrypt their facilities and to what extent. To answer this, we'll be using the CVSS risk assessment framework. Our official project goal is to determine exactly what metrics to encrypt and what to leave unencrypted. Based on the Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture, the para or more commonly known as the Purdue model. Uh, we'll be using the CVSS or the Common Vulnerability Scoring System to create this risk assessment model. As you can see here on your right, this is the lower half of the Purdue model. This is the level zero, the process level, all the way up to level three, the site manufacturing operations and control level. We'll be focusing mainly on this lower half of the model due to the fact that it's already the industry standard to encrypt the higher levels of this model. So the stakeholders for this project can be broken up into two main groups, that being the IT and OT. Uh, the IT is responsible for levels four and five of the para model, and the OT is responsible for levels zero, one, two, and three of the para model. Uh, customers are also a stakeholder in this problem because an increase in cybersecurity translates to increased costs and the possibility of lower quality products. Cyber attacks are increasing at startling rates. Uh, according to McAfee and the Center for Strategic and International Studies, in 2015, the cost of global cyber crimes was $500 billion, and in 2019, it is estimated to reach $2 trillion. Attacks like Stuxnet, Trisis Malware, Crash Override, Dragonfly, and Black Energy have crippled critical infrastructure facilities all over the world. So Stuxnet is widely considered the first cyber warfare weapon in history. It used USB drives to gain access to Iran's nuclear infrastructure facilities, and Stuxnet's goal wasn't to gain information of nuclear enrichment facilities, it was to propagate throughout the facility and attack and destroy the centrifuges used to enrich nuclear material in manufacturing weapons. So moving on to Trisis Malware, it was an ICS tailored malware deployed against victims in the Middle East, and it targets safety instrumented systems, which are responsible for maintaining safe working conditions in the event of other failures in facilities. When put into operation, Trisis Malware has the ability to shut down facilities as well as create unsafe physical states. And I just wanted to highlight on the right, we had these two pictures. The top one um, is the para model of these Middle Eastern facilities before the um, attack happened. And you can see they only have a firewall in between levels two and three, and levels three and the DMZ. And below that, to combat this uh, malware attack, they have actually included a third firewall on the level two to stop this from continuing on. So Crash Override was an ICS tailored malware deployed against victims in Kiev, Ukraine. The malware presents itself as a crash in multiple locations in the facility, and it specifically targets a power transmission substation, which resulted in an impact to Kiev's electrical grid operations. Uh, it was considered the first malware attack that specifically targets electrical grids. And moving on to Dragonfly, it was a campaign that began in 2011 with the goal of industrial espionage and intellectual property theft. And it used standard business malware practices, such as uh, spear phishing emails, trojanized software, and watering hole websites. Um, and it focused on the target's corporate network. The campaign went undetected because of the attackers exploiting the vulnerabilities on the facility's endpoints. And finally, moving on to Black Energy, it was a 2015 attack on three power distribution utilities in Ukraine. The attack consisted of two main stages. The first stage involved email phishing to gain access to the utility's IT networks and plant the black energy malware. Once there, the malware harvested credentials to gain VPN access to the facility's SCADA networks. And the second stage occurred six months after the first, uh, in which malware took control of the SCADA network areas and HMI leading to a major power outage. So the type of encryption that these critical infrastructure 
facilities are considering implementing is called asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption uses a private and public key pair to encrypt its data. So the ICS systems would have to trust the encrypted contents of the data with a private key and then decrypt those same contents with the public key. This in turn makes the in intrusion detection system or the IDS blind to the data contents of this encrypted traffic which I'll highlight in the next couple clips. So this is unencrypted HMI to PLC data stream. So the HMI would send the read request to the PLC. Now we are looking at the IDS's point of view. He can see exactly what's being sent from the HMI to the PLC. The PLC is now returning that the tank level is 49%. So if an attack was to happen on this unencrypted version and say they wanted to take it, they, um, mess up the PLC right there, they could say, okay, we're gonna put the tank level to 200%. Now, if that was to happen, the IDS would see that when the reader, when the when this the data stream was sent back, and he was like, he would be able to stop that right in its tracks. Now, if we go on to the encrypted HMI to PLC C stream, this is the same scenario. But now the IDS does not know the exact contents of the what the HMI is sending, or what the PLC is sending back. So now the IDS is blind. So if the same scenario happened and the attack was on the PLC to raise it to a tank level to 200%, the IDS would not be able to know that it was doing that and, and wouldn't be able to stop it. It would just have to trust that the HMI and PLC are both sending the true data streams. So the three most common risk assessment models in the security domain are the STRIDE model, the DREAD model, and CVSS 3.0 framework. Uh, the STRIDE model is developed by Microsoft and focuses on six key metrics. Those are spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And the DREAD model focuses on five key metrics, those being damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, and discoverability. So for our project, we decided to go with CVSS 3.0 because it's a risk analysis modeling software that you use to determine the level of risk based on individual metrics in a system. Uh, CVSS 3.0 can be broken up into three key metric groups, those being the base metrics, the temporal metrics, and the environmental metrics. And for our project in particular, we want a greater understanding of risks to critical infrastructure facilities as a whole. So we will be excluding environmental metrics because by doing that, we'd have to be looking at it an individual um, facility in a specific geographic location. So because of this, we'll be focusing on the attack vector, attack complexity, privileges required, user interaction, confidentiality impact, integrity impact, availability impact, scope, exploit code maturity, remediation level, and report confidence. And here we just wanted to highlight a simple screenshot of the original um, CVSS calculator we used to get our initial data uh, when beginning this project. Uh, moving on from this, we actually created our own Excel document that um, cal calculates all of the key or data streams of our pair model at one time, and we're going to go over that now. So this is the level zero or the process level of our Excel spreadsheet. At this level, I'd just like to highlight that the final base scores for the unencrypted versions of these data streams are 5.7, and the encrypted versions of, the data, of these data streams are 5.4, both resulting in a final risk of being medium. So this is level one, the basic control level. Um, as you see at the top, that's the PLC, which was showed earlier in the clips, so I'd like to go in more depth in this level. So the access vector for this level is local. That means that the attacker has to be logged in locally within the facility to manipulate these data streams. The attack complexity is high, and this is due to the fact that the attack would have to go through all the higher levels of the system in order to access these data streams. The privileges required are none on the unencrypted. Uh, this is due to the fact that the data is very simple data. It doesn't, it like like you saw in the previous clip, it was, you know, the tank level is 49%. That's, that's, they wouldn't require privileges to see that. But however, the encrypted um, versions of these uh, data streams are high. This is due to the public and private key pair. So if you see the, um, the user interaction in the scope, um, are none and unchanged respectively. This is due to the fact that this is a model. This is not a true actual um, scenario. So we left those as none and unchanged. So for the confidentiality, that's the confidentiality of the data itself. Um, it's, con it's considered low on the unencrypted level. This is due to the fact that, like again, it's simple data. It's not considered confidential data. Now it is none on the encrypted version due, due to the fact of you know, if the attacker got access to the encrypted data, again, it would be useless to him. Um, so the integrity, 
is high. So that means that if an attacker did manipulate these data streams, he could, could have control over the whole system at this level. Also, the availability is high, and this is due to the fact that if the attacker, again, had access to this data stream, he would have the ability to deny access within, within this level. So the unencrypted versions are, have a score of 6.9, and the encrypted versions have a score of 5.7, again, resulting in a final risk of median. This is level two, the area supervisory control level. So at this level, you can see that there's the HMI, again, that was mentioned in the clip previously. So the only thing that changes at this level is that the privileges required are now low. This is due to the fact that, like the HMI, it'd be a computer, like you see over there. The employee would have a simple login to access it. That makes that the privilege required low for the, for the unencrypted. Also, the confidentiality is now high due to the fact that now humans are using these data streams, there could potentially be confidential information on, on these systems. So the unencrypted versions of, of these data streams have a final base score of seven, and the encrypted versions have, still have a final base score of 5.7. So now on to level three, the site manufacturing operations and control level. So the only thing that changes now in this higher level is that now the access vector is adjacent. That means that the attacker can exploit these data streams only through the network that stack within the facility itself. Again, we see that the final base scores are 7.1 for the unencrypted, and encrypted are 5.7 again. So this is the DMZ, or the demilitarized zone. So now, if you look, the attack complexity is now low on some of these data streams. This is due to the fact that the DMZ is higher up in the Purdue model, so it would take less, less they have the attacker have to go through less firewalls in order to access these data streams. That results in the higher final base score in some of these unencrypted systems being eight, but the encrypted systems are still 5.7, which is immediate. This is level four, the site business planning and logistics level. So now if you notice, the access vector is on the network. Um, that means that the attacks can come from multiple networks away or network hops away. They don't have to be within the facility itself. Also, the privileges required are high for the, even the unencrypted systems in this level. This is due to the fact that critical infrastructure facilities consider this data naturally more valuable, so they require more privileges to access these. So this is level five, the enterprise level. So if you notice now, the integrity at this level, or for some of these data streams, is low. That means if the data was lost, it could be, man it could be modified, but the, the attacker would not have control over the whole system like he would in the lower levels. The availability is now low as well, so that means the attacker can no longer deny access like he could if he accessed the lower levels, but he can affect the performance of, these, of the system. Now, I would like to note that now you can see that the unencrypted versions of these data streams now have a high and medium risk. However, we see with the encrypted versions of the data streams, they now have a low risk, showing that encryption can actually reduce the risk at this level. Again, I'd like to highlight, so this is an even higher level, this is the enterprise demilitarized zone. This is the highest level of the Purdue model. If you see now, the final base score of the unencrypted versions are all six, resulting in a medium final risk. However, we see again that the encrypted versions of these data streams are 3.3, which is considered a low risk. So I'd like to state again for our project goal for this capstone is, was to determine exactly what data streams to encrypt and what to leave unencrypted. So we determined that both unencryption and encryption was needed. So the reasons for keeping data unencrypted. So the impacts of attacks at lower levels are far more devastating than the higher level attacks. Lower level attacks can result in critical infrastructure facilities completely failing or it can even result in a loss of life. The upper level of attacks would result in a simply a loss of data. So also, add encrypt encryption did not mitigate the impact of these attacks. If you remember before in the lower levels, the unencrypted versions and the encrypted versions of the same data streams both had a final risk of medium on the average. So also, for the reason, encrypting data. So encryption can protect transmissions from the older devices using text in the upper levels. And analysis of the CVSS model showed that increased encryption at these higher levels to maintain, maintain confidentiality over the internet. 
So in terms of encryption, uh, we determined that all the data streams in level four and five should remain encrypted. The reason for this, like we said earlier, it's the industry standard. Uh, in addition to that, our model really gave us no reason to unencrypt these areas. Um, and unencryption, as we saw earlier, also made them more at risk. So there's not really any purpose in doing so. Uh, we also determined that the lower half, the level zero to the level three of the Purdue model should remain unencrypted. This is due to the fact that in analysis of our CVSS model, again, we, should, we looked in the lower levels and the risk for the unencrypted and encrypted versions of the same data streams had the same amount of risk. Also, encryption is not just a switch. So in to, to encrypt all these levels, it would cost critical infrastructure facilities potentially millions of dollars in order to encrypt these. Also, perhaps the most important reason is that these attacks if, if these were encrypted, attack, cyber attacks on these levels would result in far more devastating effects on these critical infrastructure facilities due to the, being, the IDS being blind and employees working on these systems being blind as well. So it would potentially make them harder and longer to diagnose the problems compared to the, ver to the unencrypted versions of these exact same data streams. That concludes our project. We would like to thank Robert Carden for helping us design this project, our family and friends for supporting us along this journey, and Dr. Nicole Radziwill for uh, being our advisor. Are there any questions or comments? All right. Oh. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>